James Vivian, United States Army, Vietnam. James enlisted at the age of 19 like a lot of the young men did back in Vietnam. And uh, he served two tours in Vietnam, which is not something that most of the veterans did that I've interviewed. 68, 69, 70, 71 as a helicopter mechanic, but more importantly, he was an air traffic controller. I have no other story like this. He was helping with the helicopters, the landing zones, and just something you don't even think about. In today's world, we have air traffic controllers, you know, keep them separated, keep them safe, and that was his job. James served with the 123rd Air Traffic Control Company in Vietnam, and I've never said those words before. A very unique job, MOS, and uh, I'm glad to share his story here. So James, God bless you. He's still with us. I think he's 74 now, and uh, it just tells a great story. I want to thank Bill and Claire Amer for sponsoring the James' story. Thank you, Bill and Claire. God bless you. You've been friends to my work. Thank you for your flag that you sent me, the wood flag and uh, your support of my work and our country and our veterans. God bless you. Thank you for being out there. I sure appreciate you. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Bill and Claire have, there's information in the video description of this video and on my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on Sponsor a Vet. And I said in my last message that I have redesigned that page. So you see all these beautiful faces uh, of my veterans. And just, just click on the, the picture. You'll see some information about the veteran. Just added some more Vietnam stories. A lot of you are liking the Vietnam stories, so just encourage you to do that. Or to donate to my work. There's information in the comment section of this video, and I'd uh, be greatly appreciated. This is this no commercials. We've t how many times we've said that? No commercials. It's disrespectful to interrupt a story with a commercial, so I, I purposely don't do that. And the radio station, too, is listener supported. So God bless you. Those of you that get it, understand it, and are helping me, I love you for it in the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I thank God for it. Amen. This is a ministry. I'm serving my God and my country through the lens of my camera. Folks, show this, share this video, subscribe to this channel, and I'll talk to you again. God bless you. I was in Vietnam from 1968 to 1969, then I went back again from 70 to 71. So how old were you that first tour, about 19? I was 19 years old, just getting out of high school. Wow. Drafted, enlisted? I enlisted. Did you feel a sense of duty to serve your country back then? Yes. I had already went through, in fact, what got me interested was I went to ROTC in high school. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I waited until my last year to go. And I excelled so fast in the ROTC that when I graduated, I decided I wanted to go in the Army. So you're a young man over in Vietnam. Do you remember the first time you went to Vietnam, what you felt or smelled or experienced? Yes, when we first came in, we came into uh, Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was apprehensive at that time because I was looking for us to have our guns and stuff. Because here we landed in a hostile place. But they had us on a bus, and they carried us to a, a place where we were supposed to stay that night. And the first night that we was here, we got hit by incoming rounds. So that's how I got introduced to Vietnam. When you were training for Vietnam, where were you? Where would you have your basic training? Um, my first basic training was at Fort Linwood, Missouri. Okay. And at that time, did you know that you were going to go to Vietnam? Was it pretty evident? Or? Well, most of the people were going to Vietnam, but I thought, well, I wouldn't have to go because they gave me an MOS of helicopter mechanic. But then when I got down to Fort Rucker, Alabama, they said, well, your skulls are pretty high. Have you ever thought about being an air traffic controller? I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> so I said, well, they're, they're sending them to NAM as, a, as infantry and helicopter mechanic. I said, okay, I'll be pretty safe, so I'll, I'll take air traffic control. So I went to the school, 
graduated, and the first thing they did was send me to Vietnam. <laughs> So you're over in Nam, the first time. Do you feel invincible as a young man? Do you, do you, I mean, what was your MOS over there? Uh, was uh, air traffic controller. Okay, so you were, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. My job was to go in and set up airfields and mobile uh, air traffic control towers. And we'd go in and the helicopter would bring it in, put it on, on the ground, and we'd have to set them up. And then we'd bring in aircraft, helicopters, and stuff like that. And you told me you, you prepped the LZs, you got them ready, is that what you did? Yeah, when, what happened is like uh, we'd come in with these control towers, they're little small portable things, can carry about two people in there. And they would sit them on, a, uh, on the ground for us or on a, or on a paddle stool, whatever we could get to. And our job was to get the thing set up and bring in the troops and stuff. And then they would set up their landing zones and stuff as we would bring them in and take them off. So tell me about your uh, just doing that. Were they, I mean, I've talked to a lot of pilots. I've talked to the grunts that were on the ground. I've talked to you know, a lot of different people that were involved with the landing, the combat assaults. Um, where were you based out of? Well, I was based out of uh, Benoit at the time. That was the 125th Air Traffic Control Company. But because that we were a field unit, we'd be shipped everywhere. Like my first assignment was way Fubai. And it had just got through with the Tet Offensive up there. And I came in around April of 68. And when I was there, there was bodies still on the runway and stuff and in the streets and things. And so I'm new in country and I'm a little apprehensive because of the things that were happening there. So uh, when we set up our, we had already set up the air traffic control uh, thing right there in Wei Fubai. So at night, we had to worry about if the enemy was going to attack the tower, if the enemy was going to attack us. We stayed at a MACD compound. And uh, let's say basic thing was working during the day and pulling guard duty most of the time at night and shifting off with each, with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you told me on the phone to something about the LZs and how you... Go, go through that again, exactly what you did. There. Okay. And, and you, you would prep them. Is that what you did? or? Yeah, uh, on the LZ, that's the landing zone, that's what it is. You would uh, come in with the uh, air traffic control tower, and they would also bring in blivets full of gasoline and stuff so air, aircraft can refuel. Well, also, we had to, uh, like I was at just outside of Chulai, and I was assigned to a Marine unit, and their job was to go into the city and choose people to be Marines. And then at night, they would had to set up ambushes, so I went out with them. And uh, one night, as we were sitting up in ambush, they forgot to tell the enemy that it was an ambush, so we got ambushed. And we was caught between a crossfire from our company, where our company was, and the enemy, and they were both shooting at us. And we ended up running, and the Lord blessed because none of us got killed. Were you with the troops at all? Did you go on helicopters with them in and out of areas, or were you interacting with the troops? Right. I was the one who brought in the troops and stuff. And sometimes I had to go out, uh, like when our company commander would come in, I'd fly out with them to see what the LZ looked like and set up the, where we're going to set up the uh, equipment and stuff. And just like when I was, as I said, I was talking about Chulai, uh, that was during that time when that hill, the uh, Marine base got overran and everyone got killed. And so they was on their way, their way to kill us. That was during that human wave attack. And what happened was the company commander at the last second sent information to get his equipment out of there. And it was just me and this guy named Daryl Porter that uh, when he sent for the equipment, me and him got on the aircraft with our equipment and flew it out and the rest of our unit got wiped out. Did you lose friends then, uh, killed or wounded in Vietnam? Yes. I was, I was saying, as I said, that whole unit was wiped out. And it was like uh, two Navy personnel, eight Marines, and then the rest of them were Vietnamese. And so there was none that, that I know of survived because we left. Was there a strong sense of purpose, James, for being in Vietnam among the troops, you think, or did it become disillusioned after a while? Well, it was just basically trying to live. Everybody was, you know, you're looking at a day-to-day -day situation. You're just trying to survive. And when you get uh, just about time, your time is over with, we call them short-timers. 
And then we started, that's when you start worrying, because you don't figure you're going to live all this time, and you're worried if you're going to get shot on your last day or not. And so I made friends with the Vietnamese, too, while I was there. And I learned how to speak some of the language. And uh, interacting with them and seeing what they were going through made you feel that, yes, we were there with a purpose. We had to be there to help them from being wiped out because when the Communist Party would come in, they would just kill everybody. They'd kill villages and stuff. Because back home, I think, the country just didn't really support, maybe at the beginning, but afterwards, it seems like as the 60s progressed and the ramp up and the thing, it seemed like something happened here at home that turned almost our country against the Vietnam vets. Did you feel that? Or did you yeah. aware of that? Or? Yeah, in fact, when we came home, they were calling us baby killers and stuff. But they don't realize war is just like what's going on now. These kids will have uh, satchel charges planted on them and stuff, and they come up next to you just like these car bombings and stuff, but they were human. They didn't have no cars. They come up there and they blow themselves up on you. So you have to do what you have to do. One time I was uh, in my tent, and they had, one of them had dug a hole under the compound, came up by my tent, and he had reached there and grabbed my weapon. I had left it by, it, the tent was not one of those little small ones, but big enough to hold six people in there. Mm -hmm. And I had left my rifle by the door. And when I looked up, he was reaching there to grab it. And I took a machete with one hand and I threw it and it hit the, it hit the uh, tent and he dropped the rifle, and I just rolled and tucked until I got to it and I grabbed the rifle, and he jumped back down in the hole that he dug. And I started hollering, and a, a Trunk C, which is a Vietnamese sergeant major, heard me, and he jumped down the hole and captured him. And then they brought him back out of the hole, and they started interrogating him. And when he wouldn't answer the questions, they built a little, and, and, and let's say we're at war, they built a little, uh, place where they had barbed wire over the top of him and took his clothes off. It wasn't the Americans did it, it was the Vietnamese did it to him. And every time he'd raise up, he would stick himself on the, on the wire. Mm -hmm. And they kept torturing him until they found out the information they needed, and then they killed him. Looking back at Vietnam, James, does it seem like years ago or does it seem like yesterday sometimes? I still see people's bodies. I can still remember exactly what I saw when I was over there. Anytime I just, if I think of Nam, the first thing I think of is this one man, the first one I met, was dressed in black and rigor mortis had set in. And he was on his back and he was crawled all up, dead, and people just walking past him. Then I think about our soldiers. We had some that were put in body bags because we was out in the jungles. And their bodies were smelling. And some of the, our, our airplanes wouldn't pick them up. So they said once the stench is in their plane, they couldn't get it out. But there was others who said, we don't care. These are our Americans. And they ended up taking the bodies back. Did you help with any of that at times? I mean, were you called upon to help the wounded or the dead or anything like that? Or? Uh, my job was to uh, get air support into uh, places like if a helicopter go down, mm -hmm. they would call Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Mm -hmm. And my job was to get the crash and rescue if it's on the airfield or to get dust off, which is to get to them, to help them, and the medevac to get there, to, to pick them up and bring them back in. Medevacs were very important in Vietnam. Oh, that was our lifeline, because once a person get hit out in the field, they're the first, it's just like your ambulance, they're the ones that's there to pick you up, and they're, they're under fire at that time. And they got to put the, the persons on there, strap them onto the helicopter and the stretcher, and then get them out of there, and get them back to the hospital. Tell me about the Huey helicopter and its role in Vietnam. Well, the Huey was our most uh, agile plane to get in and stuff, because that's the one they used for dust-offs and uh, to pick up the troops and stuff to bring them in, the, especially the UH-1H. And uh, uh, also they have what they say, uh, door gunners. They sit on one on each side with an M60. I, I've flown door gunner myself. And I was saying your job is to be able to cover the area that you're in, watching down to make sure you don't get shot at. And sometimes we'd be flying low level, and the Vietnamese would be in the trees, and they would take grenades and throw them in the helicopter as we'd ride past. It was, it 
was the workhorse of the of the war, or the Huey was. And that's right. It carried the troops. It carried weapons. It carried our our food. One of the things that I was, uh, as I said, I think back all the time. I said I was worried that they were going to shoot the helicopter down, and our food wasn't going to get there. So every time it came, I always ate double of what I'm supposed to have. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I got the weight because the helicopters never got shot down with our food. So what was your rank at this time? Uh, the first time I was over there, I was an uh, E3. When I left, I was an E4. When I returned the second time, because when I came back from Nam, people said I was violent. I wasn't the same person that went over. And I couldn't see it, but I was one of these people that, if, I didn't try to start any fights, but if you mess with me, I would just think, I'm gonna destroy you. That was, that was all in my mind. I choked several people because, I mean, they started stuff with me, not that I did it. And uh, so after this, I think it was after the second one, that uh, they, as they said, they said I was still so violent. I said, well, let me go back to Vietnam. So I volunteered the second time. And that's how I got back over there for 70 and 71. Was that a harder tour or was the first tour tougher? Uh, the second tour, I was, my mind was not correct. Because like my company commander, he said he looked at my records and stuff, and he was going to send me out into the jungles again. And I told him I wasn't going unless he's going. And since he wasn't going, I wasn't. And I walked out. So I showed you I wasn't thinking. And then he assigned me. He said, okay, gave me, say that you don't have to go. I'm going to assign you six men to be in charge of, which they were air traffic controllers. And one of them had killed their sergeant with a grenade, but they couldn't prove it. And so these are the people I had to be in charge of. And one day, uh, playing cards, and one of them flipped the card table, I went off, and I choked him. And when I got through, I picked him up and threw him against the wall. And after that, he had more trouble out of the rest of them. But I knew I was, there was something that was in me that had changed. Well, you mentioned that change. I've heard that before. So was it just a, an aggressive behavior, or did war change you other ways, too? Uh, well, I learned to uh, accept everything as temporary. I didn't make real strong friends because I knew they, w they may be killed that day. And it, it did make me aggressive as in, as I told you, if I would defend myself, I'm, uh, my thoughts was, I'm going to destroy you. That was just it. I wasn't like that before I left. You don't seem like that today. What happened in your life? Oh, <laughs> I got a visitation. I, I say people think I'm crazy, but I don't care. I had a visitation from the Lord, and he said that you said you was going to be a servant. I said, okay, Lord, I ain't got to be put in the hospital. I ain't, I'm scared now. My field was psychiatry at the time, so anybody tell me they heard from God, I think you need some Thorazine, some living room. You're crazy. So you know it had to be a big, major change. And I've been in the ministry ever since, and that's been 25 years ago. How about in Vietnam? What were your thoughts about God? Uh, when I was in Nam... I really didn't think so much about the Lord. I was saying I knew he existed and he was good, and, but I never really prayed at night or anything like that. And uh, when I saw when we were under attack, because I was there many times, we came up uh, under attack. It was like uh, raindrops for how many bullets would come. So in other words, it was tracers. And for every one bullet, there's five that you can't see. And it looked like raindrops coming at us. Never thought about praying or anything else. Hmm. Friends, I, I, you referred to that group of people that were killed, but um, you did lose close friends that maybe you went through training with, or uh, were you, let me ask it this way, you were aviation. Right. Okay, so were you, did you have M16 with you? I had, a, uh, the first time I had an M14 with me and a 38. And the next time when I had an M16. Did you have to engage the enemy yourself in situations, or was it you were you at the front lines? If there was a front lines, or was it mainly things that happened out in the distance? It was front lines, everything. We just we got attacked, especially in the LZs and stuff. They would send in mortars and stuff. Then all of a sudden they would try to attack us, and so as I said, we set up an ambush one night because I was with the Marines, and what happened was. We got ambushed, and our claymores was in the wrong direction, for the enemies were attacking from behind us. And our troops, 
didn't know we had set the ambush where we did because we were supposed to have been somewhere else, but we, the person who was in charge decided, no, he wanted to do it there that night so we wouldn't have any engage with the enemy, and we ended up in engaging with them. And with the Marines, they don't have a word called retreat. <laughs> and so when we were overwhelmed, we had to attack and continue to fire. And then all of a sudden they had a word called advance to the rear, which I was glad to hear because the Army, we have a word that says retreat. <laughs> So we took off and we split up in so many different directions because it was that dark, we couldn't see anything. And as I was running, I was being ch chased by the enemy. And I didn't know what to do. I could, nobody was around me. I couldn't see none of my other friends. And I jumped in what they call a rice paddy. And I laid still, and as close as you are to me, that's how close the enemy walked past me and didn't see me. And when they went past me, I jumped back up and ran the opposite direction. But as I said, every one of us made it back that night. Are you fighting the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese? Who are you fighting? Uh, we was fighting the North uh, Vietnamese regular, and we was fighting the Viet Cong. Tell me about the enemy. Well, the enemy uh, was very knowledgeable about their, their uh, land. So we were strangers in there. So they knew how to set up ambushes, and they knew how to set up booby traps and stuff. They would have what they call uh, punji sticks. They were like, if you'd be walking down and you step your leg into a hole, this thing would stick you in the leg, made out of bamboo pole. And it has a lot of feces and stuff on it. So that would set up an infection in you. So as I said, the enemy was very smart. They knew what they were gonna do before we even got over there. When, they had their families and stuff moved down from the north down to the south and they had started up businesses and stuff like that so this is what you call the Viet Cong they would uh, have families and stuff and in the daytime you're, they're your friends and at night they're the ones that's shooting at you so you didn't know who's your enemy or who's your friend and that's the same thing that I see it's going over on these wars now as they're over there in uh, Iraq and all this the same thing is happening now. You don't know who your friend is. It's difficult, the uncertainty of that. Right. You're over there fighting for your country. Are you conscious of that fact, or is it just survival? It was more of a survival after a while. When you get there, you, you forget about the military thing. You're just trying to survive each day. You have to keep your eyes open to make sure you don't walk into a booby trap. You got to keep your eyes open to make sure the uh, enemy is not out there looking at you. Because one time I was uh, at an LZ, and I saw this guy behind a tree. And I looked at him, and I thought he was, you know, just part of the, the people out there. He had a rifle, AK-47. And the next thing I know, he pulled that trigger. I saw the bullet, and as it came toward my head, it went this direction. The second time he pulled it right here and it went the opposite direction. And he looked over, over his rifle and started looking at me and I started hollering that we were under attack and nobody was paying attention because they were playing volleyball and stuff and we were supposed to be in a friendly village. I reached and grabbed my, my weapon, which was an M14, and we, I ran back out there and they saw me running so then they went after me and then we found two cases of uh, AK-47, so they knew that I was telling the truth that we had been fired upon. Did you deploy as an individual or with a unit? I deployed as an individual. How about when you came home that first time? Individual? I came home as an individual then. Were you not able to re-enter society uh, or civilian life? Um, you, were you having problems at that time when you came back home? Well, as I said, when I came back home, I went on uh, leave first. And uh, my mother said there was something different about me. My friends said there was something different. I kept saying, well, I still have a sense of humor. I'm not mean or anything. And then one of my friends threw a firecracker on me. And before I realized what had happened, I was chucking him down to the ground. And he said, man, you, you ain't the same person. You're not the fun lover. I said, yes, I am. It's just I couldn't stand that noise all of a sudden. So a lot of my friends, you know, we, the, my friends from back 50 years ago, we're still friends today. What about PTSD? I've been classified as that. I have, uh, I think, either 50 or 60 percent. Uh, sometimes I get thoughts back about NAM and stuff and what I went through. 
and I'm not uh, what they call a heavy depression, but you know, you can't, those things never leave your mind. You're always thinking about it. And as I say, I don't try to, I don't remember any of my friends that were over there, the faces and stuff, except for the one guy, Daryl Porter. But most of the guys that were with me, I remember they were there, but that's it. And sometimes I don't remember what everything that happened while I was there. Why do you think that is? Well, they say that the mind will block out uh, certain traumas. Yeah. So. Wow. I've talked to a lot of veterans, and some of them are suffering with post-traumatic stress all these years later. And, uh, but a lot of them tell me it's good to talk about it. Do you tell, tell your story very often? Or? I have been lately, but for a long time. In fact, I didn't get uh, diagnosed until like 15, 20 years afterwards because I would never go to the doctor. I wouldn't talk to them about it. And as I said, most of the things that... Uh, you know, most people, they want, to, they want to hear about the blood and guts and gory things, and I really didn't want to talk about it. Well, you got the right guy. I'm not after the blood and guts of war. Mm -hmm. More interested in the personal side of what happened to you and how it changed you, so and we're right on track with that. Um, but um, I think our country has had a negative perception of Vietnam, and I'm trying to hopefully change that and the Vietnam veteran, although a lot of the Vietnam vets have suffered and struggled, but um, I think overall, a lot of them have been very successful and gone on with their lives. But uh, probably true of any war, but especially Vietnam, I think. It was a unique time in our history, don't you agree? Right, because as I say, they call them the baby boomers and stuff like that. And the life things were changing, because a lot of people were into a lot of drugs during that time. And free love and all this. And here we are over there, Fighting, and when we come back, they, as I said, they call us different names, baby killer and stuff. You kill any kids while you was over there? You know, uh, what all kind of things did you go through? And uh, as I say, our thoughts were basically, or my thought was, survival. That's all I was trying to do, survive. And when I left, I thought I would never go back again. But as I say, after being in the States for a year and the, 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 the character that I had developed, I had to go back, and as soon as I got back, it wouldn't take me long to realize I made a mistake. Because <laughs> these people are still using real bullets here. But um, some of the things is, you know, as I said, uh, the people I was with, uh, I remember one person, his name was uh, David, I mean, his name was Vaughn, and he was Robert Vaughn's nephew, the one that used to play Man from Uncle, and he looked just like him. And uh, as I tell you, we go through a lot of stuff that nobody understands. He was bored, and he decided to play Russian roulette with a pistol. And he clicked the gun, and nothing happened. He spin the barrel again, clicked it at his hand. And on the third time when he clicked, it went off. It made a little bitty small hole in the front, but it blew out the back of his hand. And yet and still, there was no emotions for anybody about it. As I said, we get, you get turned off being in a war zone. And that's one of the bad parts about it. Your thoughts is not like everybody else and they don't understand. But sometimes when you're alone, then you think about what's going on and sometimes you feel depressed about these things. Was there a battle that was harder than others, a particular engagement that you had that maybe was more difficult or was it just sporadic fire at times, sniper fire, or were there some pretty heavy engagements that you were involved in? Well, as I said, there was some engagements, but we had sniper fire. I used to be uh, in Fubai, Song Bay, uh, Bami to it. I was, I, as I told you, my job was to set up airfields and or go into where they need air traffic controllers. So I was constantly being moved around. Sometimes there would be like two of us that go into a place. Sometimes there might be as many as four of us. And we would run the uh, the control tower and stuff. James, tell me about the Tet Offensive, what it was, where it was, and, and when. Okay, well, as I said, I was in, in Tet of 1968. And they had already just uh, just about wiped out Wei Fu by. Before I came up there, it was a beautiful place. But the enemy had attacked, and I mean, there was bodies everywhere, everywhere up there. 
And uh, the people that I got to go up there to, uh, to be a replacement in, these guys had survived being trapped in a house for almost three days fighting before they were able to be rescued. Is there a, like a mini Tet? I've heard that there was a mini Tet offensive and then the major one. Wasn't like like in February? Yeah, the major one was in February. That was just before I got there. I got there in April. And the, the, what, the North Vietnamese were trying to push down or up in the mountain or what? what? Well, they were trying to sweep through the whole thing. That's what they call the human wave attack at that time. And they, some of them didn't even have rifles, didn't have no weapons, but they used sticks and pitchforks, whatever they could use as a weapon. And when they would kill one of us, they would take our weapons. War is hell. Yes, it is. As I tell anybody, you know, I got a granddaughter now that's been to Iraq twice, and she's on the way for her third tour. And I, as I tell people, I say, I hope not. I hope they'll get, they'll come back before September, because that's when she's due in. Is that right? And she's only like 22 years old. And you figure a third tour by 22, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. And she's, and she's uh, stationed in Baghdad, so she's right there where they're having all these car bombings and stuff. That's your daughter? My granddaughter. My granddaughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, three tours. Mm -hmm. She volunteer or they just send her over? They send her over because she thought she was going to be in Germany. And because she works for the corps that she works for, yeah. they said, okay, we need you in Baghdad, and they sent her over. Then she thought she was going to be there for a short time. They ended up sending her for a longer time. Then when she came back, they extended her and sent her back again. And now she's been back in the States for a year, and they had told her she's on her way back again with the next unit. You may have already answered this, but was there a harder part of your job in Vietnam, or what's the most difficult thing you had to do or experience? Well, as I say, the most hardest part with me was that I always stand out was that time when this guy was trying to kill me. And they captured him, and once they got through with him, because he g gave the information they wanted, they cut off his head. And I mean, I think about that constantly, and that they painted his head green. And as I say, it wasn't the American, it was the Vietnamese that did this. Painted his head green and put it on top of the compound. So every time you see it, you, you can imagine, I'm thinking, this is the guy that was alive, and now he's dead. How do you cope with the stress of combat over in Vietnam, or how do the troops cope with it? What you really do is you don't really, you try not to think about it, you're just trying to survive. It's like being here in Kansas City. You know, you got all these gang wars here and stuff. You, I live in the inner city, so I'm close to uh, the Crips and the Bloods and all that, and, and people who are dope dealers and stuff like that. You just survive. You don't try to try to figure anything out, you just exist from day to day. That's, that's true. Um, you know, I, just thinking about Vietnam and, and our country and, and how it was so different then in World War II, we were very supportive, you know, mm -hmm. we were united as a country. In Vietnam, something happened, but uh, do you think much about Vietnam anymore? I mean, is that part of your life? You know, do you, do you think about it at all? Does anything bring it back? Yeah, I say I constantly think about it. It's, it's something that never leaves you. You know, saying you just learn to cope with it. In fact, I had to go to uh, uh, classes with a doctor. Thank you. I think that's how it's pronounced over at the VA hospital, and we was meeting every week to learn uh, skills on how to cope. And during the time, one of the guys that was with us ended up getting killed, and no one's ended up committing suicide. As I say, the people don't realize everybody is different. And so everybody handles stress differently. And sometimes it might take a while before they just say, I give up and I'm, I'm ready to either strike out at somebody or just kill myself. A lot of Vietnam veterans have done these things. It's a, I don't I don't understand it, but I guess you look at the other wars and what's happening, and you see Vietnam and the things that have happened since the war, and and uh, having never been in combat, mm -hmm. I can just listen to the stories and 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 kind of get a an idea of what what 
way to go there. How would you describe combat or define combat? Combat is uh, of trying to, to hold your own against somebody that's attacking you. In other words, uh, you have an enemy and you're their enemy and it's your life against their life. So who's going to survive? That's what it's all about. And your will should be, I'm going to survive if the other person has to die. You talked about being aggressive when you came home, but was that because of the combat or just the situations you encountered or, or maybe both? Uh, the situations I encountered, because you can't be a coward. And so when you're under uh, stress like that, you learn to fight harder. So the same thing when somebody would mess with me, you know, like uh, to give you an example, uh, I was married at the time and I came home, my wife wasn't home, she was up at the nightclub and I went up there and uh, I saw her taking french fries, doing them in ketchup, sticking it in another man's mouth. And so I was not a happy camper. So as I was walking through, this guy said, you look violent. And when he said that, I hit him and knocked him out. Didn't know he was a, a CID agent. And so they jumped on me, and, and there was about five of them. And because of just coming back from now, I laid all five of them out. And I was going to kill her. But if I was rationally thinking, I would say, well, if she want to be with him, let him be with him. But all that I was thinking of was destroying her at that time. But I believe that came from, you know, being over in Nam and thinking, hey, whatever there they, is either them or me. It became that kind of a mentality. It's either you or me, and I'm going to live. I'm going to survive. You ever think about why you came home? I mean, a lot of guys didn't come home. Do you ever wonder why you made it back or ever ask that question? No. That's something that never crossed my mind. I, I just made up my mind I was going to make it. I'm a survivor. As I say, I slept in trees, I slept in mud, I slept in a lot of places. Because sometimes we'd be out in the jungles, we had to sleep where we could. And I had already had in my mind I was going to survive. Never once did I ever thought about, except for that one time, that I was going to die. And that's when, the, as I told you, the whole unit got wiped out. The Marines got wiped out ahead of us and they were coming down as a human wave attack against us. But that was the only time, and then I still wasn't worried about dying. It was just like, uh, I can't be killed. I don't know why. Wow. So you, you really, did you feel invincible? I mean, you're almost describing like nothing could happen to you, or, um, and then even, the, you, around the situation where people are dying and being wounded? I mean, you, you carried that through. What do you, what, how, why do you think you felt like that? What, what put that inside of you? Well, that was just, as I say, it was just something I knew that I couldn't get killed, even though I, I realized I could have get killed now, but my mind was not rational back in those days. My mind was just focused on one thing, I'm going to survive. And I had made up my mind if I ever got captured, I had a grenade, and the grenade was for me to pull and take whoever's with me. And I said, if I get wounded so bad I can't fight, I had it already in my mind that if I can't do nothing but spit on the enemy, I would do it. What does freedom mean to you, James, as a veteran? Uh, freedom and the price of freedom. What would you have to say about the price of freedom? I said freedom is not free. Somebody's got to fight to keep freedom. And that's why a lot of times when we came back from Nam and they were saying, you baby killer and making fun of us and stuff, they didn't realize a lot of people got killed so they can enjoy the freedom that they have here. You know, we may not like what we have here, but it's a whole lot better than it's been over some of the other places. When you talk to people that's been uh, oppressed, like I did the Vietnamese people, and told me how terrible things were that they'd come in and, in the middle of the night, kill people, rape their, their family and stuff. And you realize here, we have, our, we have ways of being protected. We have police officers and stuff. We have a right to choose who we want into the White House or whoever wants to run our government. We can choose that. They didn't have no choice. It's military. And they have to obey whatever the military person says. 
What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? The American flag represents blood and guts that somebody had to pay for. Every time I look at the flag wave, I think about how many people had to die so that we can have a nation and that our nation can be proud of who we are, even though everything ain't perfect, everything ain't going good, but it's a whole, as I said earlier, it's a whole lot better here than it is over there. Do you think our country is, is forgetting what happened maybe in World War II, Korea, and even Vietnam? Yes, I believe that they are. But I'm glad that people are like yourself are bringing up documentaries and stuff because what got my attention was the veterans that you were talking to in World War I and World War II. And I, that's what made me stop switching channels so I could watch it. Because I, I wasn't looking for Vietnam or anything. I was looking at them and what they went through. You saw the TV yesterday, is that what you told me? Yes. On Fox Television? Right, I saw it on TV. Got your attention? Mm-hmm. That's when you called? Right. Did you just feel like you needed to tell your story or you wanted to or participate? Well, I just wanted to participate. At first, I didn't want to do it, but it was like I was being urged. I could feel an urge that maybe it might help somebody because somebody else might have went through the things that I went through. And understand, you don't have to keep those grudges, those anger moments in you, that you can change. Because if I can change, anybody can change. Because I said I was so violent and didn't realize was, that's the worst thing, when you don't know you're violent. But you can see the results of when somebody uh, cross you or somebody do something wrong and that you don't hesitate trying to destroy them. What brought you to the Lord? I mean, how did you change? You changed your life. Well, as I said, I've, as I said, this is a little weird, but uh, I was at home and I had just thrown a birthday party for myself, and uh, everybody went home, which normally a lady stays with me. You know, I'm, I was that kind of a guy. So anyway, uh, flipped on the TV channel and saw Jim Baker on there, and I said, "Oh man, I don't want to look at this." Ain't nothing I want to listen to. Then he said, I have a guest speaker that's going to be on tonight. And I said, no, I really don't want to listen to this. And I, to this day, I still can't tell you what that preacher said. But all of a sudden, I came out of my bed crying like a baby, telling God how sorry I was about all the things I did and all the things I was doing. Then I heard his voice. I didn't see nothing. You know, and as I told you earlier, when somebody say they heard from God, give them some thorns, they in some living room, they're crazy. But he had said, you said you was going to be my servant, and you hadn't did it. And I've heard people saying they heard from God before. And uh, the first thing out of my mouth, you ain't got to hurt me. You ain't got to put me in the hospital. I'll preach. And so from that point on, I gave my life to the Lord and went over to a church, which was right across the street from me, heard the gospel there, gave my life back to the Lord, and within two weeks, I was preaching. And that was a miracle, too. Because I was sitting in the back of a church within two weeks now, you got to understand. Sitting in the back of a church, and this preacher was getting ready to preach. And he said that the Lord had spoke to him and told him I was supposed to preach. And that's how I preached my first sermon. And I sensed it. I've been through uh, the, uh, schools and stuff. But I've been preaching for over 25 years. What a change, huh? Okay, help. You said you live in Kansas City? Yes, I live in the inner city. I'm you want to live down there, or is that kind of, or you just happy you live down there? Are you talking about the gangs and all that? You're, right. You're right around all that. You got a church down there? Uh, I have a, a house down there, and I do do meetings. So I help people that's uh, as, as a uh, demon possessed. We um, teach on deliverance, and that's what I do. I'm, our headquarters is out of Phoenix, Arizona. We have like 125 teams in the United States which is only a drop in the bucket for all the people we have to help. Is Vietnam, I mean, do you talk about it with people or is it just something you don't talk about? Uh, as I said, more recently okay. because of all the gang influences and stuff. And I, I, you know, I have to give people encouragement. Hey, look, if I can make it through the war, you can make it through this thing here too. You ain't got to be like everybody else. Because I run into drug dealers, prostitutes, you name it, it's all down there where I'm at. In fact, uh, one night somebody was trying to break into my house. And the first thing I thought of was, 
this would be a big mistake. Even if I am a minister, <laughs> my house is not the one you want to enter in. Are there other stories, James, about Vietnam? Maybe you haven't told me uh, either the first or second tour. Maybe just some combat stories or just instances where, you know, things were happening that might add to what I'm trying to capture here as far as a young man being in combat, things that you saw, you know, helicopters and all that. Is there anything else that maybe I haven't asked you that maybe you could tell me? Okay. Um, I'm not trying to draw somebody. You just if there's mm -hmm. you know, Sometimes there's stories and things you may not have thought about for years, but just... Uh, I remember one time I was uh, working up at Fubai, and we were... Uh, uh, a rocket came right at the control tower and it exploded and I jumped through the floor and came down as quick as I could and then I heard somebody over the radio said, did you see where that rocket? I said, we're under attack, nobody can come in and found that it was one of our own pilots had accidentally touched a switch and fired a rocket at our own place. Another time I was doing a, I was doing a guard duty one night, it was my first, first weekend country and so I saw somebody out in, the, out in the weeds there. And so I told the sergeant, I woke him up, I said, listen, there's somebody out in the woods. And he said, where? And I hid behind the wall and tried to say, he's over there. I tried to point at him. And my sergeant said, well, show me where. I said, if I stand up, he'll shoot me. And my sergeant caught his gun and put it upside my head. He said, if you don't stand up and show me, I'm going to shoot you. And I had a few seconds to make a decision. So I stood up, waited for the guy to shoot me, and I showed him he's right over there. So they ran around and they captured him and found that he was just a Vietnamese uh, citizen out using the bathroom. But then after that, it made me not scared of death anymore because, as I said, here the enemy could kill me, and here this sergeant is killed, it threatened to kill me, and here we're on the same side. But I was scared. But after that, I got over being scared. You ever been back to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C.? No, I, just, I haven't been there, but they had the wall here in Kansas City at one time. And I went down there, and uh, I was looking over the, the names and stuff. And so the guy that was in charge, I, I walked over to him, and I said, uh, I see all these names on here. And I was in Vietnam twice, but I don't see my name on there. He said, did you get killed over there? I said, no. He said, that's why your name on there. I said, okay. You stay in touch with any Vietnam vets? No. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes, very proud. As I said, we used to meet, you know, in fact, I'm a member of the VA, a v, v here plus the VFW. And uh, as I said, I used to go for a meeting for once a year for a PS, P, whatever they call it. Uh huh. I went there for a, a whole year just about it. We met every week. And, we, you know, we talked and stuff like that, but none of us ever really hung out with each other. Have people thanked you for your service? Yes, now, recently, you know, but it's mostly always veterans, you know. We thank you for what you did. We're glad that you're back home. But, you know, it's, you know, they're trying to make you feel welcome and stuff, but that's been a number of years ago. And it's them doing it. It's veterans greeting veterans. It's not the, the normal public saying, hey, we're glad what you did. How about your homecoming? Did you have any sort of homecoming when you came home? Or they, you hear some horror stories about homecomings from Vietnam vets? <laughs> well, when I came home, it was just like I had never left. You know, my friends just accepted me, no big parties or anything. And that was about it. How old did you say you are? Fifty-eight. Fifty-eight. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. You ever been back to Vietnam? Or? No, I thought about it several times going back because I've just wondered: is there any of the places I was there are they still in existence? Because, like as I said, I was in Saigon for a while, and I wanted, you know, I think if all I do is say the word, and I automatically I think about the Sicilo, and I think about the the buildings that we were at, and just like we going for massages and stuff. And I think about all these places, and I wonder if any of the people are alive. And like one of the pictures that I showed you from Nam is a uh, Vietnamese there. Me and him were real good friends, but I can't even remember what his name is now. I'd be wondering, did he ever survive? 
and uh, some of the other things. Like I had, it's funny now that I'm talking about. It, I'm thinking about these other two guys. They were one was from uh, Philadelphia, and the other one's from Arizona. And we were real. They were both in the Air Force. I was in the Army, but we were so close with friends. If one went one place, we'd all go. What should our country remember about Vietnam, James? That it's just like the war that's going on now. It's taking children and making them grow up quickly. In other words, uh, age 19 years old, you should be going to college. You should be getting an education, starting to fill out your future. But here, you're learning to kill or you're going to be killed. So. They should understand that a person might come back. I ain't going to say they will be, but they might come back changed and not to criticize them or try to pick out how many people did you kill? Because that was one of the questions I always got. How many people did you kill? I don't want to think about that. My job was to stay alive. And that's what they should understand. When these people are coming back, they may have nightmares uh, where they can't sleep at night or they might get very agitated at small things, you know, but you got to understand what they went through and what they're going through. And once it's there, it never leaves you. Once it's there in reference to the memories or the happenings? The memories, the happenings, it's always there in your mind. As I say, all I do is first thing, if I hear the word Vietnam, the first thing I think of the first day in country, we got attacked. First time when I was sent up to uh, Fubai, and there it was, this guy laying up there with rigor mortis. It's automatic. I mean, I ain't got to think about it. It automatically comes to me. And that vision never leaves. When you hear the word Vietnam, you think of these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what kind of weapon did you carry over there? I carried an M14 the first year and a uh, 38 pistol. I also had a, uh, what they call a submachine gun that shot 30 millimeters. So it's been a while, I can't remember. I think it was 30 millimeter. And it just went thump, 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 you know, slow like the old machine gun. And I also had a uh, 50 cal when I did guard duty at night. Because one night when I was out uh, at one place, we kept hearing this duck going quack, 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 quack. And so I had a M79 grenade launcher, a little small one at that time, fired around at it. And then all of a sudden I heard it go quack, 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 quack. I said, no, nah, that can't be. So I fired a couple of more rounds. And our company commander at that time was a colonel, and he made a comment. He said, I came over here alive. I'm going back alive. He said, I don't care how many rounds you have to shoot. You fire, so make sure I don't get killed. <laughs> and so I fired several more rounds, never did hear anything. Then all of a sudden it started cracking again, so I knew it had to be enemy out there. It was just trying to play on our nerves. And then we had what they call uh, a mad minute. We got attacked, and when you get the, what a mad minute is, when you get attacked, everybody shoots in a 360-degree area, not inside the camp, but outside the camp. And it lasts for about a minute. Then you take it off of automatic, and you put it down to uh, single shots. It's funny, I just now remembered all that. <laughs> You're remembering stuff, huh? Mm hmm Now, you engaged the enemy yourself. I mean, you were, I mean, in the job that you had, you still were out there when they attacked? Or right. I was saying, like, as I told you that one time when we set up an ambush, we got ambushed. And uh, it wasn't an everyday fight. That's another thing a lot of people don't realize. We don't fight every day. But it's according to where you at. You know, it's different, like... Uh, you're in Saigon, well, they didn't get attacked as much as when I was in Fubai or when I was out in uh, LZ Jake or Tan Lashan. Now, these places got attacked just about every day. So that means snipers would be shooting at you, mortars would be coming in at you. And at night is when they, they didn't usually attack during the daytime, but at night. And that's why a lot of... GIs, they, are, uh, they know not to smoke because once you light up a cigarette, you can see that thing for miles. And the Indians would shoot at the, at the flame. Was there drug usage in the Vietnam in the areas you were at? Or? Heavy, heavy drug users. 
marijuana, uh, uh, sniffing coke and all that. In fact, I had one friend that he snorted it so much that his nose started bleeding. And you'd think he would stop, but no, he kept doing it anyway. And they had these pills, uppers and downers, what we call number 10s and stuff. And uh, it was, as I said, there was quite a few drug users there. In fact, about if you wasn't, they would make fun of you. Like one time they'd say, smoke a bowl for Uncle Sugar, because I didn't want to smoke. And they oh, man, come on, light up for Uncle Sugar. And they would put uh, uh, marijuana in the pipe, and then they'd put what they call hashies over the top of that and want you to smoke so you can get high. Segregation, was that a problem over there, or Vietnam? Yes, that was one of the problems I had, because uh, as I said, I was an air traffic controller. And where I was at, uh, in fact, they, they kind of made fun of me. They said, blacks ain't that smart to be no air traffic controller. How did you make it through? And uh, I just stayed to myself most of the time. And then when I got transferred out, one of the guys that was up there, as I said, Daryl Porter, that's the guy, he showed me, he said, man, I'm sorry for what they did to you up there. He said, I wasn't with them, but I couldn't do nothing against them because I was not in charge. He said, but from this point on, I'm going to teach you how to be a good air traffic controller. And he's the one that taught me. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. At the end of my interviews, I, I ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that from where you're seated when I tell you? Yes, sir. James, right into the camera. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good, good, good. Good salute.